Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second, like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If you would, please stand. Number 400. I care not today what the Lord will be bringing you shadow or sunshine or rain.
you'd like to open your New Testaments to 1 Peter, in just a minute we'll be reading just three or four verses from there, beginning with verse 18, 18 through 21. 1 Peter, 18 through 21. We're about to take part in that part of our worship service that Christians all over the world will be doing along with us on this first day of the week. And it's a part that we often think of, I think, and have even said it's the most important. It's not. It's of equal importance with all of the things we do when we come together to try and do the things that please our Lord. It's just as important and no less important than singing. We all should take part in because we're told to praise our Lord and exhort one another in that way. We pray for the same reasons because God tells us to cast our cares on him and to seek his guidance and wisdom for the way we should live our lives. We give, as we'll be doing here in just a few minutes and talk about more, uh, because of all the things that he has given to us and our remembering of those things. And we teach in our Bible classes and in our sermons we have when we're gathered together in worship because we're instructed to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus. And because Jesus told us, his disciples, to go into the whole world teaching people to observe all things that he's commanded us. And because we know one of the functions of the church, the jobs of the church, is to make known the manifold wisdom of God. And what greater evidence is there of our Creator's wisdom than His reminding us and asking us to remember the reason for all of these things, the reason for everything that we have. When we remember what Jesus did, as we're about to do now, what he gave and what God gave through his son, with his son, we really remember who we are as Christians, why we have faith and hope, why we have the things that Peter talks about, one of the many passages in our Bible that remind us why we should live the way we should live as Christians. Peter, talking about why we should conduct our lives in a certain way, says we do that because, beginning in verse 18, 1 Peter 1, because knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct, received by tradition from your fathers. We don't do the things we do because it's merely traditions that men have established, but because this is what we read in the Bible that God wants us to do. It's his plan. You were redeemed not with silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. We know that when Jesus came to earth, it was part of God's plan because of his love for you, that is for me, for all of us, that he would make possible a life eternal. But the cost of that would be the blood of his own son. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. It was always part of God's plan when he created us because he loves us. So he made this possible by this great sacrifice but was manifest in these last times for you. How blessed we are to live in a time after our Lord came to the earth and gave himself. And this is why we, who through him, verse 21, believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. When we partake of this Lord's Supper, when we remember these things, we're remembering the reason we have faith and hope. We're remembering that there is a God and we want to please him and eventually to live with him directly and permanently forever. Will the men come forward, please? Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, as we are about to partake of the emblem of our Savior's body, your son who came from heaven from that glorious eternal life that we cannot even comprehend we pray that not just now at this moment 
but all of the time in our lives, we will remember all that that means to us, all that that offers to us. We pray as we partake of it now, we'll do so reverently, and that you'll be pleased. We ask in Jesus' name. continue our thanks, Father. We pray that we'll continue our remembrance and that we'll continue observing the thing that matters so much to us in a way that pleases you as we partake now of the emblem of our Savior's blood. Be with us, we ask in Jesus' name.
come to the part of our service to our Lord where we do another one of those things we mentioned we should all take part in and that's giving we give because we do remember the work that God wants the church to do the church being us Christians we give because we pray that we always remember the things that God has done for us and what it cost him we're instructed to purpose in our hearts what we want to give and a great example of man with purpose in his heart in his attitude toward giving to God was King David in the Old Testament in one ex instance in his life he was about to make a sacrifice and a man offered him the materials to do that but David said to this man who had offered it no I will surely buy it from you for a price nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. How much has the Lord, has it cost the Lord to give us all the things we have? The cost of his own son. Let's remember this as we try to please God in our giving. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we ask you to forgive us all of the times that we fall short in doing so many of the things that you would like us to do and want us to do. But we thank you for forgiving us. And we thank you for giving us hope, giving us the opportunity to have, even on this earth, abundant lives and further ahead, a life that will not end in happiness. We pray that you'll help us to remember this when we give right now and at any time and we pray that the way we give and the way we conduct this right now will please you help us we ask in jesus name amen song books and would like to mark the song after the lesson this morning, that will be number 538. Number 538 will be the song after the lesson. And the song before our lesson will be number 756. We'll sing the first verse. First verse of 756. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the Two passages. The first is Mark chapter 12. And when you get to Mark 12, I want you to take a ribbon, put it right there in Mark 12. Mark 12, put a ribbon there. We're going to compare these two gospel accounts. So Mark 12, place your ribbon. After you've done that, go to Matthew chapter 12, uh, 22. Matthew chapter 22. This will be the text for uh, all of the, the, the whole sermon, but we will compare Mark 12. So 
I uh, hope you have the ability with a ribbon to flip back and forth when we do. Matthew chapter 22. When you read this chapter, it is the week of the Lord's death, his crucifixion. To be more specific, Matthew 22 is a Tuesday of the Lord's death. He'll be arrested and crucified on Friday. He'll resurrect on Sunday, but Matthew 22 is Tuesday of that week. As I read this text, and I've read it a couple of times in preparation for this morning, and I've read it before, but every time I read this text, I always feel like I'm sitting with a toddler. I have a, a four-year-old niece. She's not three, she's four. I FaceTimed her on Valentine's Day to talk to her so that I could see her and just wish her a happy Valentine's. And, and while talking to her, I had mentioned that she was three, and she very quickly said, I'm not three, I'm four. But when I read this text, I feel like I'm sitting with Madeline. Because I'm going to call this day the day of questions. I sit with Madeline, and for lack of a better question, this is maybe how it goes. David, Uncle David, why is the sky blue? You know, Madeline, I don't really know. I think I learned back in school that it's something about the, the light of the sun coming to earth and it's all kinds of different colors and the length of the, the blue light and the gases of the atmosphere and when it reaches the sky, it, it turns blue. And, and I try to give her that kind of answer. And then she says, but why? Well, you know, Madeline, I don't really know. I guess that's what God wanted it to be. But why? And you give her another answer. And no matter what you say, she's always going to say, but why? And so when I read Matthew 22, we're going to read four questions that they are going to come to Jesus and ask. And again, I just feel like a toddler sitting there asking question after question after question after question and I just feel like Jesus on this Tuesday is saying to himself I'm about to go to the cross stop asking me questions but he doesn't do that but we will see the questions that they ask this is the day of questions I'm going to categorize them for you as we look at them now let me say the difference between Madeline and any toddler asking questions is that they are innocently curious, but these individuals are trying to trap Jesus. If he will just say one thing wrong, we got him. The first question is a personal question. And you actually got to back up to the previous chapter, but it's still the same day. Still Tuesday. They come to Jesus in verse 23. And these uh, who ask this question are the Jewish Sanhedrin. And they come to Jesus, and Jesus has been teaching, and he's been preaching. And they simply come to him, and they say, By what authority... Are you teaching this? That's a personal question. Who said you could teach what you're teaching? Now, as a side note, Jesus was a master at answering questions. He hardly ever gave people directly what they wanted. He, he somehow took the question, turned it back on them, put the ball in their court, 
and amazed people with his answers. This is what he said. If you read there, I'm going to paraphrase for time. Jesus basically says, I'll answer your question if you answer mine. Where did the baptism of John come from, heaven or earth? The Sanhedrin got together there and they decided, well, if we say this, then this is going to happen. If we say this, this is going to happen. So they realize that no matter what they say, they are in a predicament. And so they come back to Jesus and they say, we don't know. And so then Jesus says, well, since you can't tell me, I'm not telling you my answer. Then we have a political question. In chapter 22, going back to our chapter, verse 17, they come to Jesus and they say, and these are the Herodians, by the way, and they say, Rabbi, is it lawful for us to give taxes to Caesar? And it's this time of year, about a four-month span, that I wish Jesus said no. I don't really wish that. I appreciate what my taxes and your taxes can pay for that otherwise would not be funded. But this is what the Lord did. He said, give me a denarius. Give me a piece of money. And I don't know how it happened, but I'm assuming maybe somebody there, you know, had a purse bag or a money bag, and they got a denarius, handed it to the Lord. And the Lord said, whose image is on this? That's the image of Caesar. Well, then you give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and you give to God what is God's. What bears the image of God? You do. I do. In Genesis chapter one, two, three, Genesis 2, I think it is, there in about 25, 26, 27, God said, let us make man in our image. Give to Caesar what bears his image. You give to God what bears his image. You give him yourself. All right, question number three. We have a doctrinal question. In verses 23 through 28, they come to him and they say, You know, the law of Moses, and that's why it makes it a doctrinal question, because they're referring back to the teaching of Moses. You know, Moses said that if a man has a wife and he dies, the wife goes to the brother. If he dies, the wife goes to the next brother. The wife dies. They they say this happened seven times, and then on the day of judgment, whose wife does she, whose wife, uh, wife is she? Which of the brothers does she belong to, according to the law of Moses? And Jesus says, well, they will be like the angels, because the angels are neither married or given in marriage, and that's what you and I will be like. That's what she, the husbands, the seven brothers will be like. They're not given in marriage. So in the resurrection, she's not going to be any of their wife. We have a doctrinal question, but then we have our question of interest this morning. We have a religious question. Now, I want to maybe compare Mark here. So don't go there yet, but get that ribbon ready, and we're going to flip over here in just a minute. But notice Matthew 22, verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees. Okay, the Sadducees asked the previous question. The Sadducees asked, whose wife shall she be? Now, these are the Pharisees. So you have the Jewish Sanhedrin, you have the Herodians, you have the Sadducees, now you have the Pharisees. And when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. They're getting in their huddle. (laughs) Then one of them, a lawyer, he knows the law of Moses quite well. He might could have quoted for you all of the commandments within the law. Asked him a question, testing him, saying, 
Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, flip over to Mark 12 and notice what is said there. Mark 12, verse 28. You seem to get the impression that this lawyer was impressed with Jesus, impressed with his answers. And so he's like, okay, that's a great answer. Let me give you one and see how you answer this one. Verse 28, Mark 12, Then one of the scribes came, this is the man, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, he's impressed with the Lord's answers, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Flip back to Matthew 22. Which is the greatest commandment? Now, whenever you and I read this text here, that doesn't mean a lot to us. Which is the greatest commandment? But you see, you have to put yourself in that day and live under the law of Moses. Because you see, the Jewish rabbis had no less than 613 commandments. You can Google it. It'll give you that answer. No less than 613 commandments. And so then you come to Jesus and say, which one is the greatest? What's he going to say? This one's better than that one? Oh, okay, does that mean I've got to focus more on this one than that one? I mean, if he gives any kind of answer here, he's going to say this one's better. Then they're going to say, okay, well, then you don't have respect for the entirety of the law. Which commandment's better? See, it's a, it's a trap. It's a test. Maybe to understand this a little bit more, as we break it down, there were 248 positive commandments, meaning if you read the law and the commandments, there's 248 commandments that say do this, do this, do this, do this, and then there's 365 that say don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, 613 commandments. And maybe to understand this context a little bit better, when we go to Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, it says that the Pharisees and the scribes come to Jesus and say, why do your disciples break tradition why are they not doing this and jesus says why are you so concerned with tradition that you're breaking commandments so let me ask you this how would individuals in that day determine the greatness of a commandment how is one greater than the other? Well, they might, by one method, judge the greatness of a commandment by the severity of the penalty attached to it. If this commandment, you just get uh, slapped on the hand for doing it, and this commandment puts you to death, well, obviously this commandment's greater. Some magnified laws that revolved around the Sabbath day and and thought that the Sabbath day commandments were greater, according to Mark 2, 23 and 24. Others seem to lift up tithing. Matthew chapter 23, 23 through 24. Each individual, each sect had their own ideas about which commandment was greater. So now we're interested which one he's going to say. But what did Jesus say? It's interesting that his answer here came without any kind of rebuke. If you notice in verse 18, Matthew 22, in verse 17, they asked him a question. Tell us, do we pay taxes? Verse 18, but Jesus perceived their wickedness. Say, why do you test me, hypocrites? He rebuked them. In verse 29, he does the same thing. In verse 28, Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall of the seven she be? Jesus said unto them in verse 29, You are mistaken, not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. So question, he 
rebuked them. Question, he rebuked them. But then when you get here, this question, the Lord doesn't do that here. Also, he directed this question to the questioner, not the crowd. In verse 34. And when the Pharisees heard it, and silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question. Teacher, drop down to verse 37. We know the question. Jesus said to him, perhaps looking him square in the face, Flip back to Mark chapter 12. Here's what's taking place. Question number one. Question number two. Question number three. Question number four. I've already told you that it appears that this lawyer, this scribe, who asked the Lord this question was impressed with the Lord's response. But it also seems like the Lord is appreciative of the scribe who asked the question. And that comes from Mark's account, Mark 12, verse 34. Let's back up to verse 33. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your soul, with all your strength, to love one's neighbor as yourself is more then all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices, and this is what the scribe is saying. He's repeating the answer back. Verse 34, listen and tell me if you don't think Jesus is impressed with this scribe. Now, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, meaning the scribe answering back to him, he said to him, Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. Jesus says to this man, You're not far from my kingdom based on what you have just said. Now, consider with me the Lord's response. Tuesday, four questions. The Jewish Sanhedrin the Herodians, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. 613 questions. A lawyer impressed with Jesus, Jesus impressed with the lawyer. Here's what Jesus says. Love the Lord your God. Let's go to the text in Matthew 22. Begin in verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Some passages insert strength. This, verse 38, Jesus says, is the first and greatest commandment. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Question number one, why is the love of God the first and great commandment? Answer, two parts. Number one, because this is an Old Testament precept. This is a commandment that has found its way ever since the beginning of time until now. This is a commandment that you and I have in common with Adam, with Eve, with Cain, with Abel, with Joshua, with David, with Daniel, they were all commanded to love God. Today, you're still commanded to love God. It has threaded its way all throughout history. In Joshua chapter 22, Joshua chapter 22 Verse 5. But take careful heed. 
to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love your God, to walk in His ways, and to keep His commandments, to hold fast to Him, and to serve Him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Answer number two, why this is the first and greatest commandment. Because He loved you first. In 1 John chapter 4, 9 through 10, we love Him. Because before the world was ever created, He loved you. John 3 and verse 16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son to die. Question, why is this the greatest commandment? It's an Old Testament precept. goes throughout all of time. And he loved us first. Question number two. What does it mean to love God? You're sitting there this morning and you say, David, I love God. Can I tell you what that statement means? Yes, love may involve emotion. I feel great this morning. I feel joyful and happy because I love God. And the singing and the worship and the Bible class, it, it, it feels good. But what about the time that the emotion is no longer there due to tragedy, due to hardship, due to heartache? What if it doesn't feel good? Because you see, loving God involves your entire being. Loving God involves your human psychology, your mind, and your actions. Loving God indicates that you and I humbly submit ourselves to Him. Because we realize that God is supreme and not us. God is self-sufficient, not us. God is righteous, not us. We're righteous through Christ. God is a God that that we should serve, not self-serve. Instead of self-will, it is His will that should be at the forefront of our minds. Love for God includes all of which God is related to. If you can comfortably sit there this morning and profess with your words, I love God, then it means that you also love the Son. His Son, Jesus Christ. To love God means that you love the church because it is His. And He sent His Son to die for it. Ephesians 5.25, Hebrews 10.25. If you love God, then you love the Word that He breathed for you to own and to have and to study and to live. If you love God, then you will not only love His Word, but you will keep His Word, 1 John 5, 3. Jesus says, love God. This is a response that Jesus obviously knew from Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. As I have no doubt, Jesus was very familiar with, with the scriptures you shall love the Lord your God Deuteronomy 6 5 says with all your heart with all your soul and with all your strength love your neighbor this injunction is from Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18 isn't it amazing to you how many of the Lord's answers and responses to people came out of the Old Testament? He's not making this stuff up. He's referring back to what's already been written. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18. Love your neighbor. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You see, loving your neighbor is not 
a, a commandment that's scarcely found throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament. In fact, it's found in all of these passages, Matthew 19, Luke 10, Galatians 5, James 2, 1 John 4. Love your neighbor. And of course, you could probably tell me, as well as I could tell you, the parable about the Good Samaritan. They came to Jesus, who's my neighbor? Is it the individual across the, the, the street from me? No. It's everybody. People that don't look like you. People that don't talk like you. People that don't believe like you. People that don't vote like you. Love your neighbor. And let me end this point with this statement. Love of God ultimately means that we embrace love for any individual because they are made in His image. You can't love God and hate your, your neighbor. It doesn't work. But let me give you a positive and a negative to this real quick, just so that you see it. There is a positive and then there's a negative. In Romans chapter 13, verse 10. Romans 13, 10. This is referring to loving your neighbor, but this is the, the, the negative part. Don't do something. Romans 13, 10. Love does not harm a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love does not harm. And sometimes it's your words that harm, not your actions. But then there's the positive in Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, and we won't take time to, to read the, the text in its entirety, but Luke chapter 10, it begins in verse 29, and, and <clears throat> this is... Uh, I have the wrong path, but it's the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan. Love your neighbor. That's the good. The positive aspect. Now, love yourself. What you and I need to understand about this commandment is it's not the third commandment. It does not go love God, love neighbor, love self. No, no, no. Read it with me. Love your neighbor as yourself. These go together. If you love yourself, you will love your neighbor. If you love yourself, you should love your neighbor like you love yourself. Now, you might say, well, David, isn't that a little self-righteous to love yourself? Isn't that a little arrogant? Isn't that what pride is? Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Paul, I think, describes love of self perfectly as he describes marriage. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 28 through 29. Ephesians 5, 28 through 29. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. What does it mean to love yourself? Well, you provide for yourself. You protect yourself. You preserve yourself. That's love for yourself. It's Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so as we approach love, this is our priority to love as humans, as Christians. To love God. To love your neighbor as you love yourself. But here's your takeaway. If you love God like you're supposed to love God with, with all of your being, if you love Him with everything you are, the love that you have for God will overflow into love of self and love of neighbor. It all begins with the love of God. And the others will come naturally. As we piggyback on Valentine's weekend, and yes, the red coats for Valentine, 
And this morning we considered our love and what the Bible says for us. Tonight we're going to think about God's love. But this morning you need to understand that God loved you so much that he died for you. And the invitation is yours to put him on in baptism, to love him so much that you're willing to do whatever it takes to follow him for the rest of your life. The invitation is yours to do that this morning, or maybe you've wandered away, maybe you're struggling, maybe you need prayers, maybe you need encouragement, maybe you need to talk privately. Whatever it is that we can do for you, we're willing to do that this morning as a family that meets here at Fayetteville. The invitation is yours, but let me encourage you as we walk away this morning to love God, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Will you come as we stand and sing?